afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Vermont has one of the highest rates of Lyme disease in the country. As most people know, Lyme disease is spread to humans by the deer tick, which is also known as the black leg tick. A decade ago, there were about 100 cases of Lyme disease in Vermont. Now there are upwards of 500 cases each year. A professor at Green Mountain College in Poultney is actively researching the deer tick. His work includes DNA testing to determine the levels of bacteria within the tick that cause Lyme disease. Joining me is biology professor Bill Landisman. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. So how is Lyme disease spread in nature and then ultimately to people? Well, it's so the uh, bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi it causes Lyme disease and that is uh, acquired by people and other animals through a tick bite. Uh, this bacteria is cycled in nature between ticks and a variety of different animal hosts, anything that the tick would take its blood meal from. Uh, so uh, ticks hatch as larvae, free from, believed to be free from infection, and those larvae then search for a blood meal from almost any kind of mammal or lots of different bird species. If the animal from which they take the meal is carrying Borrelia burgdorferi, then that tick can become infected. Mm -hmm. They then molt into the next stage, which is the nymph, and that nymph, if it's infected, will then search for a blood meal again and can infect the uh, the next host that it that it feeds upon, which could potentially be a human, or an, and that's how humans would get it. Uh, the nymphs can then uh, uh, have another chance if they weren't infected to obtain Lyme disease from another host, uh, and then when they become they molt after that blood meal, they molt into adults, which then have another chance of spreading the disease. My goodness. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how do you study the risk of acquiring Lyme disease from place to place? Uh, two key factors that my lab looks at and other labs are the population size of ticks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, so the more ticks that are present in an area, uh, the riskier your chance of getting Lyme disease. Um, another factor is uh, the, the percentage of ticks that are infected with the bacteria. And you mentioned the nymphs or the nymphal life stage. Why is an abundance of nymphs an important risk factor for Lyme? Well, it's a really good question. The, the nymphs are really small, and it's much harder to notice them when they're, when they're on you. I think we have a picture of exactly how tiny they really are. Right. Uh, okay. So now we're looking from left to right, the teeniest one. Right, on the left there is the larvae, and they mm -hmm. have six legs, which might be hard to see without a uh, microscope. Uh, they're free from infection, most likely. The next one up is the nymph, which is about the size of a pinhead, and those are uh, hard to notice. Uh, and then the two to the right of that are uh, the male and female adult ticks, which are also very dangerous, but you're more likely to notice them on your body. The nymphs are also active in uh, from late May to early July, that's their peak period of activity. I mean, they're active mm -hmm. most of the year, but and but that period in June is when people tend to be outdoors. It's spring, it's nice out, and so that's a further reason why the nymphs are of a concern. So do we know why the risk of acquiring Lyme disease is higher in some places than in others? Uh, well, there's lots of uh, good work being done on that. It's a complex issue. We don't know all the factors, but um, it's really useful to study wildlife biology to understand what's happening. Um, the especially of, of interest is uh, what's happening with populations of the white-footed mouse. That is the host that is most likely to pass on the pathogen to a tick. And so if we can get a handle on what's happening with the white-footed mouse, we can better predict uh, how, how uh, Lyme disease transmission varies from place to place and over time. Uh, thing, uh, factors such as land disturbance, forest disturbance, this is a forest dwelling organism, can affect their population sizes. They tend to be more act, uh, more abundant and more disturbed forests. It's just one example of, of how Lyme disease risk varies, and it has to do with um, factors such as disturbance, which affect the white-footed mouse. Mm -hmm. Because they, the white-footed mouse loves a smaller patch. We were talking earlier because the risk of having a predator nearby is less. Right, there are fewer predators and uh, fewer predators and fewer competitors. So when you have a disturbed site, um, the white-footed mouse can colonize that site. Everything clears out. The mouse can colonize really quickly and be free from predators and competitors. Right. So what can people do to reduce their chances of getting Lyme disease? Uh, well, I think awareness is the biggest issue. Uh, this program, for example, mm -hmm. is uh, really important. And just to be aware and know that ticks are out there and um, to check yourself as much as possible. I like to say, it's very unrealistic, but I like to say it's like brushing your teeth, do it twice a day. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not terribly practical. What you can do is if you're 
if you've been outdoors, when you come inside, put your clothes in the dryer uh, for an hour. Less might be okay, but that, mm -hmm. that will kill the ticks on your clothing. So before and just dumping them in the hamper, put them right in the dryer. You definitely want to do that because they'll get out and then they'll crawl around. And this is another <laughs> hidden risk of getting Lyme uh, tick bites is that you may never go outside if someone, someone can bring a tick into your car or your home. And, and so the dryer, um, there are bug repellents that you can find uh, commonly available that can also help if you're out in the field. Let's get into some of the specifics of your research. What's the overall goal? Um, well, we're just trying to understand how the risk of acquiring Lyme disease varies from place to place in nature. And um, so we are uh, looking at how the population sizes vary and the infection rate varies. Mm -hmm. And so who and, provides the funding for your work? Uh, the Vermont Genetics Network, which is based out of the University of Vermont. Uh, they offer uh, competitive grants for faculty at several colleges across the state. And they also offer uh, professional development opportunities, which combined with the support and the development we get at our individual institutions, we're really in a, a great position to do high impact, uh, meaningful research in the biomedical field specifically. Let's talk a little bit about how you collect your data. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Well, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, to determine uh, tick population sizes, we take a denim cloth, which is, and you can see it up on the screen here, that's a, a square denim cloth, and we drag it. Those are uh, Izzy and Seng, two of my undergraduate researchers, and they're gra uh, dragging it on the forest floor and um, um, across a measured distance, and they will then check the cloth periodically and <clears throat> count the number of ticks they collect, and they can determine the number of ticks per unit area, which is um, a way to determine the tick density, which we can then compare from site to site. Mm -hmm. And so how do you estimate the size of the tick populations more than that? Do you just count the number in that particular area? Does it change daily? Do ticks move around a lot? Yeah, uh, daily, uh, more seasonally. Mm -hmm. So from month to month, you'll see a peak around June of the nymphs. Mm -hmm. You'll see a peak of adults in the fall. Um, they can also change from year to year and, um, and even across decades. Um, you know, ticks weren't always present in Vermont. Um, this is a fairly recent phenomena that the, right. the populations are expanding. And so um, what do you do once you count the ticks? Do you collect them as well? We collect them, right, and we test them uh, to see if they're carrying Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. And how do you do that? So we take the ticks into the lab, we grind them up, and we use a st fairly standard procedure, um, which is what you're looking at here, um, to take out and isolate all of the DNA in that tick. So some of that DNA is DNA from the tick itself. Some is from uh, Borrelia burgdorferi and anything else that might have been living inside that tick. And we uh, take the DNA and then we will test that DNA for a gene that is unique to Borrelia burgdorferi. And that will, uh, it, and we use a test called polymerase chain reaction to determine if Borrelia burgdorferi is present. Mm -hmm. uh, what else can you learn from DNA analysis? Well, in addition to Borrelia burgdorferi, there is a whole community of microbes living in that tick gut along with Borrelia. And we can, uh, this is a fairly new field um, of research where we now have the tools to measure the entire microbial community in that tick gut. And it's possible that the, you, the specific composition of microbes in the tick gut are going to affect Borrelia burgdorferi's ability to survive, either help or inhibit. So that's one thing we can do. We can also determine where the tick received its blood meal. Mm -hmm. If a tick, for example, got its blood meal from the white-footed mouse, there will be DNA from that white-footed mouse in the gut, and we'll be able to detect it. That's coming next. We're, all the work we're doing now is, is leading up to those tests, which we'll do soon. So what are some of the takeaways from your research so far? Well. Uh, it's clear that both the population size of ticks and their infection rates are very variable. Um, let's talk about population size. Mm -hmm. um, if you imagine the size of a football field in a forest, at a low site, we might find 20 to 40 nymphs. That's a low site. We have other sites that are twice, where they're twice as abundant, you know, 40 to 80. <clears throat> we have one site where there would be the equivalent of 1,000 nymphs on that football field. So, Highly variable. The same for infection rate. We have some sites where the infection rate, 20% of our nymphs, and we are focusing our studies on the nymphs because they're the biggest concern, 20% are infected. That's a low site. Mm -hmm. Low. So there's never none, right? right? At least in our area in Rutland County. Okay. 
uh, on the high end, 40 to 50 percent. Wow. Yeah. And so, what determines the density of the population? Um, the density of the population of, of, the, of the nymphs? Yeah, you said um, in one football field there could be you know, a lot on one side, not so much on another. Right. Um, well, it has to do a lot with the, um, the, the hosts that are there. Um, it's called the deer tick mm -hmm. sometimes, and so that's one example. If you have lots of deer, that can really increase the number of, of ticks in the area. Um, there are lots of other factors um, that, uh, that tie in, again, with disturbance and, and what other host species are there. So can Lyme disease research, like what you're doing, ultimately help reduce the frequency of Lyme disease in nature, which would then, I would assume, translate to people? Yeah, um, I think this research helps in two ways. Again, the awareness. Um, there's also uh, the potential, and this is uh, certainly not just my research, but what others are doing around mm -hmm. the country, to uh, see if there's a way that we can manage our natural areas to reduce the populations of these hosts that are really uh, propagating Lyme disease and ticks. It's a long way off, but there is this uh, potential to, to, to manage our lands in that way. How does your research support your teaching efforts at Green Mountain College? Well, it's a great, uh, it's a great way to teach, um, to, to have students doing this hands-on work. Green Mountain College uh, promotes active learning, hands-on experiential learning, and so uh, we, I, I'm able, with the funding uh, from VGN and the support from the college, I can hire students over the summer to do this research. All the research I'm describing, I'm not really doing the work. My, my students are doing the work and under, under my mentorship. Um, we also use these activities in our, in our classroom in microbiology and ecology specifically. We have activities where students can collect ticks, determine population sizes in microbiology. They can test the ticks to, to learn how, how you test ticks for infection. So it's been really a great educational tool. And is this similar work being done at colleges in other parts of the state as well? Uh, yes, it, uh, certainly in Vermont. Uh, Alan Giese up in Linden State is doing similar research, and um, David Allen at Middlebury College is also doing Lyme disease research. And there are other people across the state as well. Um, can you give us sort of a, a thumbnail sketch on what you think that you've seen so far and, and what you think the tick population um, is in Vermont and, and the percentage of Lyme disease, do you think? Is it safe to say that there's a pretty good chance that if you're out and you get bitten by a tick that you will develop Lyme disease? Uh, certainly not. Um, there, and, and this gets, uh, so first of all, not all ticks are infected. Um, it is a high rate, nymphs anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. So you have at least a 50-50 chance that the tick is not infected. The adults um, are probably a higher infection rate, 50 percent or more. Um, if a tick has, if you have a tick bite, the sooner you get it out, the better. Uh, the general rule is that it takes 24 to 36 hours for the bacteria to make its way from the tick into your tissues. Um, I certainly wouldn't wait that long um, because you never know for sure. But right. the sooner you get it out, the better. Um, personally, um, between this research and some other research, I've had many tick bites. Um, I've and. Um, well, I've never tested positive, but um, uh, so far so good. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's not a guarantee, but the awareness is really is really important. Right, and you were saying that you should build this into your routine, your regular outdoor routine when you come in. I, I, that's, I mean, especially if you're working outdoors, certainly for when I do research and, and my group is out in the field, that's part of our job. We, uh, we come home, we leave time to take care of our clothing, check ourselves, and, and do it multiple times a day, um, especially during the, during the uh, summer and spring months and um, if you spend a lot of time outdoors, especially if you're in, in a forest. The forests are, are where this is most common, but you could, get, you could pick up a tick anywhere. Even in your car, someone could bring, bring a tick into your car or your home. But no need to panic. Just be aware. No, certainly no need to panic. <laughs> I mean, there are plenty of, um, uh, every part of the world has its, has its uh, risks and dangers, and, and this just happens to be what we have here in, in Vermont. And no, certainly don't panic. <laughs> well, thank you Enjoy so much. Enjoy nature. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.